So welcome to lecture two, module seven. And today we're going to talk about how to calculate the camber and deflection of pre-stressed concrete beams. So if you remember back to module one, we looked at some of the factors that affect camber. So we looked at uh, the concrete strength, the modulus elasticity. As those two properties increase, the concrete gets stiffer. So as it gets stiffer, uh, the concrete doesn't want to bend as much. So uh, increases in strength and modulus also decrease uh, the amount of camber in our pre-stressed concrete beam. Also, the larger the pre-stressing force here, uh, the greater our camber forces, the larger the eccentricity, the greater the moment. Therefore, the greater and more camber we have in our beams. Section sizes and the weight of our section. We have a larger moment of inertia, which means the beam's stiffer. We have a smaller amount of camber. And then also we have a, a bigger beam. It's going to weigh more, which is, makes it more difficult for the, the beam to camber. And, and then finally, any additional dead load that we have on our pre-stressed concrete beam also decreases camber. So uh, here are the kind of the six basic assumptions from the Nawi textbook. We discussed those. Uh, when we calculate camber, we assume that moment inertia for the gross section properties are, are good enough. We don't have to use transform section properties, but if we want to get a little more accurate, we can use transform section properties. The modulus of elasticity is based on the concrete strength. Uh, we can use superposition to a uh, that applies to all the deflections. So that means we can calculate the deflection due to live load, deflection due to the dead load, to the sustain to the sustained loads. Add all those up and that's what our ultimate camber or deflection may be. And when I say camber, I mean the upward deflection. When I mean just when I just say deflection, I'm talking about the downward deflection due to like self weight or the live loads. We talked about how we're going to assume that we have one single tendon that's acting at the center of gravity of the pre-stressing strands. Uh, instead of multiple strands, we have one resultant force at the center of gravity. Any deflection to the shear disregarded. And then we assume that all the sections can be treated as totally elastic up to zero stress in the bottom fiber. And then once they have stress in the bottom fiber, we can use the crack moment of inertia. Okay, so let's look at an example. This is uh, example 5811 from the PCI Design Handbook. And uh, we get some information from 5223 from the Design Handbook. That information is the uh, superimposed sustained load and then the superimposed live load. Uh, but it's this double T uh, and it has um, a compressive strength 3500 at release and 5000 PSI as a 28 day strength. So we want to calculate the initial camber. So we just cut the strands and how much camber do we have in our girders. So if we went back to this, it's a single point depressed strand. So we have, you know, here's the ends of the girder. So our pre-stressing force goes down to one point in the middle, then goes back up. So our strand profile looks something like that. And so from the PCI Design Handbook, here is our calculation for camber. The pre-stressing force times the eccentricity at the ends, times the overall length squared over AEI, plus the pre-stressing force times the difference here, this E prime, uh, the, is the distance from the location of where the strands start down to where they are at mid-height, times L squared over 12 EI. All right, so we look at those values. We can calculate our moment of our modulus elasticity. So it's 33 WC 1.5 times F prime CI. We get 3,587 KSI. If we took 57,000 times the square root of F prime C, uh, this value here, if you take 150 to the 1.5 times 33, you almost get 57,000. So it, it's pretty close. They have this uh, unit weight term in here, just in case you're using some lighter weight concrete. We know L is 70 feet. We went back to one of those earlier problems in the PCI design handbook that refers back to the P0 term is 335 kips. So we have 
um, our e sub e term, this first point at the ends is 5.48 inches, so 335 times 5.48 times the length times 12 squared to get to inches over 8 modulus elasticity times i plus uh, 8.42, that's the distance from here to here, times 335 times our 70 times 12 uh, squared over our 12 times the e times bone inertia. We get an upward camber of 4.35 inches. So it's going to bow up in the middle a, a little over 4 inches. Now the self-weight counteracts that. So we went back to our PCI design handbook and looked at 1513. We have a simply supported beam. That's what this double T would be. It has a uniformly distributed load. That's what the self-weight would be. We know that at the center, our deflection due to that self-weight would be 5WL to the fourth or 384EI. So let's put in our values. Moment of inertia, modulus elasticity is still 3587. Moment of inertia is 20,095. So our equation of 5W, that's the self-weight of our beam. And this is pounds per foot. I want to convert to pounds per inch because these terms are all inches squared. Times 70, convert to inches times 12 to the fourth. I get the deflection due to uh, self-weight is 3 inches. So if this double T was sitting on supports, it would deflect 3 inches in the middle just due to its self-weight. So if I added those together, so we got 4.35 inches acting up, 3 inches acting down, and so the overall, the net camber at release is 1.35 inches acting up. Okay, so let's now look at the final <coughs> deflection or final camber for our beam. Uh, so we know the initial camber and we know the deflection due to self-weight. Those are two of the key things we need. So if we went to our table 5.82 in the PCI design handbook, so this is final deflection. <coughs> Excuse me. And these are the multipliers that we will use to multiply some of our initial numbers by to get final. So this is a composite topping or without and with. And so the composite topping is a two or three inch overlay of concrete that they put on top of the double T's to tie everything together. So for our example, we're going to say we don't have a composite topping. And the composite topping adds a little more dead load, so it reduces uh, the camber. And you can see these multipliers are a little bit less when you compare composite with a non-composite topping. So we have non-composite without. So we have that. And then we also have final. So we're looking at these multipliers. So we know the final camber to the pre-stress is going to be equal to our initial camber. So the pre-stress at the time of release multiplied by this 2.45 factor. So our initial camber is 4.35 multiplied by 2.45. So at the very end of the, the beam's life, uh, the camber, the upward deflection due to the pre-stressing force would grow to 10.66 inches. Okay, that's one aspect. But then we have the downward component. So this applies to the elastic deflection due to the component's weight at release of pre-stress. So this would be the self-weight. So we know that the deflection at release due to the self-weight is 3 inches. We multiply it by this uh, multiplier of 2.7 and we end up with a downward component of 8.1 inches. So we also have from problem 5223 a superimposed dead load which is 10 pounds per square foot. The double T is 8 feet wide so that's 80 pounds per foot. So we're going to take our deflection, which is our 5WL to the 4th over 384EI. So E is now 33 to WC to 1.5 times the square root of 5,000 because we're the final deflection. So we have our 80 pounds per linear foot. We end up with a downward deflection of 0 0.48. So then I'm going to take this deflection downward apply to elastic deflection due to superimposed dead load only. So that's this. So we're going to multiply by 3. So my final camber then is my 10.66, which is up, minus 
minus 1.44. So without any live load on it, that, br that double T is deflecting 1.1 inches upward. Okay, so what about if we have live load on it? Well, uh, the uh, problem says there's a, a superimposed live load of 35 pounds per square foot. Double T, once again, is 8 feet wide. So we multiply that 8 times 35, and we get a, a 280 pounds per linear foot. Now, I want to calculate the uh, stress due to this load. So it's simply supported, uniformly distributed load. So the moment is WL squared over 8. Okay, so and I do some conversions in here, and you end up with 2,058 kip inches. Well, that's a corresponding stress. So stress is equal to NY over I. This is the Y bottom. There's I. <coughs> Excuse me, of 1.68 KSI in tension. You know, then what causes our concrete to crack? How much tension? So the modulus of rupture of concrete is 7.5 screws F prime C. So that's 0 0.530 KSI. So we've got cracked concrete based on this, but we can't forget that we also have some compression forces due to the pre-stress force and then also due to the self-weight and sustained load. So remember our self-weight was 418 pounds per linear foot and a sustained load of 80 pounds per linear foot. Multiply that by 70 squared over 8 is 3,660 3, kip inches. The corresponding stress is 2.99 so I'm adding more tension in here. So there's one tension, there's the other, but I've got to subtract out the compression due to the pre-stressing force is P over A. We went back to the earlier problems. You see that the, the pre-stressing force after losses is this 298 kips divided by the area. That's our uh, eccentricity at mid-span. There's our Y bottom. We're going to divide that by 20,985 uh, inches to the fourth of moment inertia. So we have a compression of four. Uh, 4.12 KSI. So let's add all that up. So you have these two in tension minus this in compression. We end up with the bottom fiber of 550 PSI or 0.55 KSI of tension. We compare that to this value. <coughs> Our section is, is barely cracked. We're to right over that tension. So what does that mean? Well, we can use our live load deflection then. Uh, of being our live load, which is 280. That comes from our uh, superimposed live load of 35 pounds per square foot times 8. We have that converted times 70 times 12 to the fourth over our moment of inertia, our modulus elasticity in 3.4. We have a downward deflection 1.68. So I could use the crack moment inertia for the leftover load that causes this 20 ksi. Of, uh, of tension. Okay, so remember we found that the stress in the bottom is 550 or 0.55. It cracks at 0.530. So there's a small amount of force that is over the cracked, uh, cracking stress or cracking moment of the beam. And what that means is now that it's cracked, the moment of inertia has changed. And we could use a cracked moment of inertia to calculate the deflection. So that's like anything, once it cracks, it's not going to be a stiff, so it's going to deflect a little bit more. But because we're close, it's really not that big of a deal. But uh, in the book, it does go through that calculation to show that you are going to have more deflection uh, for that small extra 20 KSI because the beam has cracked. Okay, so uh, we have a uh, back to our superimposed dead load of 0.48. We have all this. We have due to self-weight, due to pre-stress, final deflection, just superimposed dead load 1.44, live load of 1.68. So our final camber, then subtract out the 1.68, we have a 0.56 inches of deflection downward. So how does that compare to this? Well, if we go to our maximum permissible deflections, we have a roof for floor construction. L over 240 is our limit. We put in that our maximum deflection is 3.5 inches. We only have 0.56, so we're perfectly fine. So that concludes this lecture, too. If you have any questions, 
please feel free to contact me anytime.